Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. Coming up, more Malia, uh, the knife that Ernest Emerson always wanted to design. And then we take a look at my top 10 future heirloom knives. These are the knives that I think right now uh, that if my daughters sell off the whole collection, I would like them to keep these and keep them going through the family just to show what knives, what the what the premium knives in my eyes were in the early 21st century. Uh, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and really actually do hit the notification bell. That's just something I say because I've it's become a part of... Uh, just what I say. But when you hit that bill, you do get the notification. And then you know when I do upload something new, like a podcast, like a Thursday Night Knives on replay, like a close up video. So please do all of that. Uh, now, um, a pocket check. And uh, please like Thursday Night Knives, participate in this pocket check. Comment below. Let me know what you're carrying today. It's always interesting to me. And I know we have a very classy audience here. So uh, today, speaking of class, I was carrying this, my Chris Reeve Knives Sabenza 21 with black micarta inlays. Uh, now, funny thing about this knife. First of all, this knife, um, when you look at the birth card, uh, as they call it. Uh, it was built on Leap Day 2016. So it it only has birthdays every four years, which is kind of cool. So it's a unique knife uh, in terms of its date. Uh, but I have lately really come to appreciate this knife in a way I didn't before. I bought this before, you know, when I got this, it was uh, almost felt like a, an imperative. You know, you really do have to have this knife. You have to experience it, this and that. So I bought it and um, really loved it, but but kind of kept gravitating towards flashier designs. Well, lately, maybe it's with the onset of my advanced age, uh, I've been looking at knives slightly differently. And this, to me, is really what everyone else has been saying it is all these years. Uh, that's how I am. I'm always, like I say, late to the party. And and uh, it's like when Kurt Cobain died, I was like, hey, man, Nirvana's awesome. You know, people are like, yeah, where, where have you been the last uh, 12 years? Uh, but anyway, the Sabenza 21 is awesome. I've been carrying it a lot recently. And I got to say, having a screaming sharp edge on this thinly hollow ground blade, uh, compliments of Jared Neve, is really... Uh, adds to it. This knife should be razor sharp. If you have a Sabenza, if you have a Chris Reeve knives, all, all your knives should be razor sharp, of course. But there's no excuse to not have a razor sharp Sabenza. And I didn't for a while until I sent mine to Jared. So check out Jared Neve, check out his sharpening freehand on stones. It's amazing. Uh, next, today I'm carrying a fixed blade as I, as I do quite a bit, especially summer and uh, winter time, uh, because I have stuff untucked and over, you know, or a vest or sweater or something. And uh, so today, my fixed blade carry is the Ron Steel Designs Prime. Uh, this is the drop point. He does make a, uh, a really nice Bowie slash clip point of this blade. But I thought the drop point version of it was so unique. I had to get the original. So this is the prime. This is the original uh, profile. And uh, Ron Steele was kind enough to figure out putting a, a uh, secondary edge on it for me. I love a double-edged knife, as you know. And uh, this was the first double-edged prime he's made. I'm not sure if it's the only at this point. But, man, you got to check out Ron Steele Designs. He's going to be coming on the podcast sometime in October, I believe. He is uh, a graphic designer, somewhat new to knife making, but has really hit the ground running with it. If you look at this, uh, this is a very tight weave linen micarta in maroon and then black and gray liners, uh, G10 liners. And those, incidentally, are my high school colors. Uh, I uh, That is incidental or coincidental, I guess. Um, but I think it's kind of cool at this point. 
Let's let that focus up. So, yep, today I'm carrying the uh, Sebenza 21 by Chris Reeve Knives and the um, the Prime Double Edge Drop Point by Ron Steele. And uh, hmm, let's see. Yeah, there it is. Look at that. It's all keyed in for this tight close-up here. And uh, what a fine close-up it is. So double my carta today. That is the only place where I have duplications in my uh, in my carry today. Uh, if you're not aware, I have some weird rules uh, because I carry more than one knife a day, more than one folder a day usually. Can't have the same lock, can't be from the same brand, can't have the same blade style. And um, I guess that's it. Sometimes I get deeper, like it can't be... Uh, two titanium handled knives. One of them has to have G10 or micarta, something like that. Uh, so if that sounds like you, uh, you're in the right place. If that doesn't sound like you, you're still in the right place. You're just a little healthier. <laughs> so uh, you can check out all these knives on Instagram. I've been posting uh, pictures there. I also put up audiograms, uh, little one minute snippets that uh, Jim harvests from each podcast and sends to me, and then we put it up on Instagram. So you can get a little preview of what that week's podcast is. Uh, so go to thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram and check all that out, indeed. All right, so you know about Patreon, and you know that we have a growing um, roster of patrons uh, to whom I'm extremely grateful. Thank you so much uh, to everyone, not only who supports on Patreon, but who watches and such. Uh, but every month we do a Gentleman Junkie giveaway knife giveaway gentleman junkie is our top tier of support and part of what you get there is entrance uh passively uh every month into a knife giveaway and this month we're giving away a knife that once again was bequeathed to the channel by dave this old sword blade reviews you got to check out dave uh this old sword blade reviews and he gives us lots of cool knives uh to the channel he'll he'll send and uh, we use them for giveaways, uh, even though I'd like to keep them almost every time. So here we have a, uh, well, well, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Here we have a beautiful Acta Non Verba. This is the, uh, this is the model, it's hot, I'm gonna turn it cool there. This is the model Z300 ANV, of course, Acta Non Verba which uh, I, uh, I'm no Latin scholar, but I have a feeling it means actions, not words. And I like that. Uh, this design is truly, I mean, I frequently say that a knife looks like a shark, but this really looks like a shark. Okay, so uh, the, the blade definitely looks like the bullet shape of a Mako shark or a great white shark. The flipper tab is definitely a nice dangling pectoral fin there. And then the handle, it has a deep belly here that terminates in a, a very streamlined pommel there. So to me, this really does look like a shark. Okay, so all of those kind of visual metaphors aside, what do we have here? We have Schleipner steel uh, drop point with a beautiful full length swedge. But something I like is that they still, even though it's a full length swedge, they still left some beef right here at the end of the blade for your thumb. I hate it when you feel like you, you have your thumb on a near edge, you know, on something that's almost a cutting edge. So they leave you some meat there, which I appreciate. They also crown it over, which is nice. Uh, excellent uh, access to the flipper tab. This is on um, nylon, nylon washers, and it just fires out. Uh, I, I thought it was bronze, um, but man, really, really nicely done there. And then at the tip of the flipper tab here, you'll see there's a little loom luminescent dot there so you can find it in the dark and uh the deep carry wire pocket clip is excellent i mean it's ultra deep carry you're not seeing even a speck of this knife when it's deep in there one nice big solid standoff just a gorgeous knife by the czech republic company acta non verba uh, they came out of the gate with a bunch of really sweet models uh, this is the only one i've had my hands on i really like it uh, there are a couple of fixed blade knives they make that are just knockouts. Uh, so um, I need to look more into Acta Non Verba, but in the meantime, I'm going to give this one away uh, to a gentleman junkie. So uh, join us on Patreon, thenipejunkie.com slash Patreon, and uh, that way you can become an, a, a gentleman junkie and, and 
be in the running for that. Uh, so that's uh, thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Make sure that you go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Got a question or comment? Call the Knife Junkies listener line at 724-466-4487. Okay, so you know Swags. Uh, she used to work at uh, the Smoky Mountain Knife Works. That's where we all uh, first met her. She was part of their media team. And uh, uh, knife enthusiast, uh, southern girl, um, did a lot of outdoor stuff, fishing and that kind of thing that that uh, you saw her doing. Um, and so she started designing knives. and. <clears throat> There, uh, one was made by Kaiser, the Swayback, which is really cool. And I have a weird story about the Swayback, uh, because I swear to God, I ordered one, but I never received it. And then, um, well, then I couldn't find the receipt. So who knows? <laughs> uh, it could have been a fever dream, but I, uh, it's a really cool little Swayback, uh, button lock flipper. And then, um, she also created one with CJRB called the Melia, named after a dear friend of hers who I think may have passed. And um, a great little two and a half inch blade, oh, sort of bellied worn cliff. Well, now they're coming out with a larger one uh, with a three inch blade called More Melia. And I think that's that's kind of clever. Uh, this is in CJRB's um, uh, A, A, what is it? A, A, R, M. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Hang on. Uh, I, you know, sometimes I have trouble with the blades deals, uh, but this is. AR dash RPM nine, AR RPM nine, AR RPM nine. I'll say it a bunch of times that way I'll remember it. But so that's uh, CJRB's proprietary steel. Uh, I think it's like 440C, who knows? Uh, but it's got really nice milling. It's got a teardrop shaped handle that um, I have never held this knife itself, the the Melia or the more Melia, uh, but I, I have held knives with similar handles, and I really like that bulbous teardrop shape behind a thinner waisted uh, choil. It really uh, sort of blossoms out into your hand and really nestles in there, and you get a very sure grip, especially for a grip that is maybe less than a full four finger grip. And I would say that the regular Melia, the smaller one, is probably in that camp. But I just think it's a cool looking knife. I think I think she's designed two really nice, nice looking knives. Both of them on the worn cliffy side, though the swayback, of course, has a fully straight edge. So it is an actual worn cliff. Uh, these look as if they have decent enough belly to do most kind of cutting you want to do, um, but also a bit of a point. And with that swedge, um, the point becomes more. Um, effective. Anyway, interested in this. I do like the uh, anodized pivot collars and thumb studs. That kind of thing is always kind of a little bonus. And I think it takes, I don't know, probably relatively uh, little effort on the manufacturer's part, but it really, I think it, it adds, really adds something. Uh, so anyway, CJRB and Swags come out with the more Malia. Check it out. Next, Best Tech and Kombu. Kambu is a really prolific designer. Um, I believe he's from Poland and his, uh, man, he does a lot of stuff with, um, with Best Tech knives and very kind of out there designs that seem to be very utilitarian. Um, so uh, I, I think that Kambu's designs are really appealing and um, maybe sometimes I've described them as over-designed. But this one I think is really nice. It, it's a, uh, a take on his take on the Poku, I'm sorry, Puko knife from Scandinavia. It's the, it's the uh, Scandinavian ground um, uh, outdoors knife, if you will, wood, wood, wood style knife. But this thing, so it's called the Thyra, which is a, uh, a, a portmanteau of the words Thor and Vig, meaning uh, Thor and fight. Thor and fight. Uh, so it's obviously Nordic inspired, uh, but just a really nice looking thing with a, a sculpted titanium handle with a um, Mokutai bolster. But, uh, and, and he's going to be doing all sorts of they, meaning Best Tech and, uh, and Kambu, will be doing all sorts of different sort of handles, playing with the, playing with the uh, anodizing of the titanium and of the bolsters. But uh, I think the really interesting thing here is the blade. 
when you look at it, and, and this article does not mention, I do not think it's a Scandi ground blade. I just think it sort of um, emulates one. It's got a sort of a steep grind, sorry, steep bevel grind. Uh, but when you look closely, you can see a, a, a primary cutting edge that is not the, so in other words, this is not a zero ground blade like a Puko. Um, if you're, if you care, uh, obviously you're getting this, you're not getting it to, you know, work wood by the by the campfire this is a uh, a carry knife this is an edc this is an instagram knife and i i am not belittling it i i am not saying it's not beautiful and and awesomely produced i'm sure it is but this is not the kind of thing this is not a puko for puko's sake this is a puko for concept sake for design sake for look at this cool modern take on a puko so interesting if you're a kombu collector i would say this is way up your alley. Uh, I really like that recent one that he came out with, and I can't remember the name of it now, but it was a, sort of a bellied worn cliff with a real high spine. Just a cool looking knife. It kind of almost looked like a Nesmuk to me. Um, so, so that would be it for, uh, yeah, Space Age Puko. Check it out. I don't know. Might be your thing. Uh, I like Kambu. I really, really respect his designing, uh, and Bestek has just, has just, consistently knocked it out of the park. And uh, that's the last of my sports analogies for the day. Still to come, State of the Collection, we take a look at a couple of knives on loan. And uh, then my top 10 future heirloom design uh, knives. These are knives that I will pass on and hopefully they remain in the family. Uh, so stick around. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. I have a couple of really awesome knives on loan to me from, from good friends of the show uh, that I have to show off today in the state of the collection. Unfortunately, it's not my collection. This is now the state of some other people's collections, but that's how we roll here because uh, I am lucky enough that people want to send me knives to check out, and I'm very grateful. And um, I usually say, give me three weeks to a month with it so I can make a video and get it back to you. Um, and I, I try and keep it for less time. I know what it's like to have knives far afield. Uh, you lay awake at night wondering, what's going on with that knife right now? Are they are they doing things? Are they hammering nails with that thing? Uh, so anyway, uh, our good friend Callow PR, you know him as uh, as that on Instagram and Callow Blades on, on uh, YouTube. Uh, our good friend Edwin sent me this. This is the Emerson... EX100. Let me, let me bring this. There we go. Emerson EX100. This knife uh, is, as you can see from the blade, part of the Collectors Association. This is number uh, 93 out of 152. So they made 152 of this beautiful EX100. And uh, our good friend Edwin got number 93. As the Collectors Association. So this knife, um, like a lot of the knives that you see on Edwin's channel, I mean, he has the ultimate, ultimate Emerson collection. And not only does he have everything in all of its iterations, uh, seemingly, but he also gets these knives from the Area 51, I think they call it. And these are uh, the Emerson Vault, old knives, um, valuable old prototypes, that kind of thing. And then he'll send a sort of written statement with each one. Well, this one um, to the Collectors Association, he sent a written statement. And the, the gist of it is, this is the knife that's been rattling around in his head this whole time. This beautiful, simple, I mean, to me, even though it's got uh, nicely contoured grips here, and it's a, it's a, first thing I thought of was, oh my God, this is his 110. This is Ernest Emerson's Buck 110. And I think Edwin posted some pictures of this with the 110. So that may not have been an original thought, but I think the whole idea is uh, Ernest Emerson grew up in Northern Wisconsin on a farm, you know, spent a lot of time in the woods, used knives. And uh, though he made his bones and his bread and butter uh, on tactical knives with waves that uh, with wave opening features, you know, that the most 
high speed, low drag individuals take to their work environment. Uh, but all along, he was still a country boy, still a farm boy. And I know he's uh, he's moved to Colorado. He's got a ranch and he's doing a lot of that, that kind of stuff again, connecting with his roots uh, as a country boy and as a as a uh, farmer that making this simple knife an ode to the simple, uh, you know, clip point pocket knife like the 110 or the 112 was something he's always wanted to do. Here, let me throw I talk about the buck. Let me roll in. Here's the 112. Sorry, I didn't bring my 110. Uh, but, you know, similar in that it's a clip point, but also similar in that it is 100% practical. Um, it's just simple and beautifully stated. It's quite thick. It's about as thick as the uh, as the 112, if not a little thicker. Actually, it's a, it's a touch on the thicker side. And uh, I'd wonder if that isn't because, um, and, and this is where I'd love to find out from Edwin or someone uh, from the Collectors Association, does he put more uh, thicker, more luxurious <laughs> slabs of G10 on his special knives? Or is this a thicker handle because it's meant to do different stuff? You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an all-arounder for sure, and you could use it tactically. But this thing, this is a, this is a working man or woman's knife. This is a, a farm knife. This is going out to the barn and cutting stuff uh, kind of kind of knife. And we've seen a bit of that recently with the Overland and some uh, some of his, uh, the Carnivore I think has a that vibe as well, even though it's a sort of a steak knife, but it has that sort of plain knife for knife chores vibe. And um, man, I love this thing. And I love the Gray G10. Uh, and I looked at this and I was like, yep, there's another Emerson incidental front flipper. You can front flip it easily with the protruding tang. Uh, a lot of my Emersons you can do that with. Uh, so he was front making front flippers before they were cool, <laughs> maybe unintentionally. Uh, this has its, uh, this is a brand new knife that uh, Edwin was kind enough to send my way. Beautifully centered. Uh, like most new Emersons, it has lock stick but a well-loved Emerson loses its lock stick pretty quickly. Um, so I know that bristles sticks in some people's craws, but, uh, but if you really like the knife and I do, man, I love Emerson knives. Um, that goes away quickly. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was going to do a video. Uh, let me know if you want me to, uh, I was going to do a video taking last, let's see, Two summers ago, I got the Emerson sax, and it had, it had um, lock stick that was making me sad. It was making me like depressed. It's <laughs> like, is this ever gonna go away? Is this a lemon? What's going on? And it was my first single detent um, Emerson since they went to the single detent. Ends up, you know, two years later, it it is so like amazingly smooth, and and it happens every time for me with Emerson's. I get it. I get lock stick and I'm like, oh no. And I go through this little panicky phase and I just open it a few times, carry it a few days, uh, maybe sometimes more than a few. And, uh, but that lock stick goes away and it blossoms into the most uh, 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 tight and uh, easily non-sticking, um, but stout to the blade, uh, to the spine whack kind of lock. So, um, there's a lot of hyphens in that statement, but uh, Emerson's always come around. Let me put it that way. So thank you. Thank you so much, Edwin, for loaning me this very valuable EX100. I really appreciate your trust uh, in holding on to this thing for a couple of weeks, and then I'll send it back to you. Beautiful EX01 from the Collectors Association of Emerson Knives. All right, next up on the State of the Collection, another loaner knife. Now, this loan opportunity came up whilst talking to this gentleman on uh, Thursday Night Knives. Uh, this is on loan from uh, Ketmuk Nesshart. You know, he's a, a frequent contributor in the comments, and he actually came on screen uh, two weeks ago on uh, Thursday Night Knives. And uh, we got to talking about the Canadian belt knife as a, as a profile, as a type of knife, and uh, how much I love it, how cool I think it is. And he, he just so happened to have this beautiful LT right. This is the uh, the large Northern Hunter Canadian belt knife. But I'm showing it in the sheath first because uh, I know you can't feel it, obviously, but it is a sumptuous uh, yet very stout 
uh, leather sheath. Just beautifully done. I, I love leather. I could go vegan in every way except leather, I believe. Uh, but anyway, so here we go. Look at this thing. God, is that gorgeous. I love the the whole profile of a Canadian belt knife. It has this sort of almost barong teardrop shape. Sometimes it's, uh, this looks like the point kind of goes right down the center uh, from the pins in the handle down the center of the blade. But sometimes the Canadian belt knife, it looks like the tip drops a little bit. Uh, but I think there's wiggle room, like there's wiggle room with any design type like Tanto or Bowie. The Canadian belt knife, um, I've seen variations, I'll put it that way. Uh, this is an incredibly comfortable in hand handle. I don't know if you've uh, ever held a LT Wright knife. Uh, this is my first time. Man, uh, LT Wright, uh, they make a great knife. Now, I know they do some OEM work, like um, uh, Nordic knives. I believe uh, David C. Anderson's knife company. Those are made by uh, LT Wright, and I believe a couple of others. Uh, it's kind of like how Bark River does. But, oh, man, this handle is just incredibly comfortable, uh, not just in design, uh, but also in material and how it's contoured. Um, Nesmuk, or I'm sorry, Kepmuk asked me to send this back by October, um, which I fully plan on doing, uh, you know, way before then, but uh, for camping or for hunting season. Uh, he's looking forward to using this to for uh, dressing game, cutting open game, <laughs> gutting game. Uh, look at this really cool um, maker's mark. It's a log cabin. It looks like a log cabin. Uh, some sort of cabin in the woods right there, evoking hunting and that kind of thing. So this... It, it this seems like a new knife to me. So I'm wondering if this is all proto story uh, or if this knife has some experience built into it. Um, so, you know, I didn't think to ask Ketmuk that, but I will be asking him because I'm interested. It seems like a brand new knife. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing if this will have some great adventures uh, this fall. So that is the LT Wright um, Canadian belt knife uh, called the Northern Hunter, the large Northern Hunter. Also, there's a small version. Uh, one nice thing about this sheath, let me show you real quickly, is that it's got a D-ring and a dangler. So if you're getting in and out of your four-wheeler or whatever and having something that's rigidly attached to your belt is uncomfortable, you have this sort of D-ring dangler thing. You can just sort of uh, flop it wherever it needs to go. Flop it. Anyway, you know what I mean. So uh, there it is. Thank you uh, for that loaner. I really appreciate it. I'm going to make a video of that, probably show it off with the only knives that are comparable in my collection are, are the um, Bark River knives. So uh, I see why they're sold by the same out, outfits. Okay, next, um, I spoke recently with JB Stout and uh, a really, really cool guy, Tennessee knife maker, uh, who, who, just has such a cool style. Um, I knew him for, uh, I guess when the lateralis first came out from Boker, I, he was, he was on my radar, but as a way out of reach <clears throat> custom knife maker. Well, since he's uh, licensed some of his designs, uh, three of them to Boker knives, uh, the lateralis named after the tool song, the, uh, Leviathan named after the Mastodon song, and, uh, and the Omirta, named after I'm not sure what. Uh, but three really cool knives, all coming out from Boker, all with his uh, heavily sort of milled um, Art Deco kind of style. Just beautiful work. And um, spoke to him, and he sent me a T-shirt and this. This is uh, a tool that he makes out of D2 steel, a pry tool. This is called the Broner. So, bro, I think... Uh, I think I think this would be a great bro tool because you can open beer with it. Uh, but it's got a, a, a thin sort of spatula edge uh, that you can use for scraping. You can use it uh, for uh, screws. You can use it for, I don't know, all sorts of uh, prying applications. You got your beer there. You got these uh, three big jimps, which for some reason feel like they must have some other purpose. But just a really cool thing, and I really appreciate 
his sending it to me. Thank you, JB. This is like, this is really awesome. And I know it came off of his, uh, you know, his mill in his shop. He lives uh, on a huge piece of property. It sounds enviable. I know they, there's lots of woods there. And uh, so it's, it's interesting to me to have something so uh, sort of modern and sophisticated uh, looking as this coming out of a, 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 an, a, a rural place, a place in the woods, a natural place, because to me, this looks so beautifully modern and machined. Uh, really cool thing, the Broner. Uh, check him out. Check out JB Stout uh, Knives on Instagram. Um, you'll be happy you did. It's pure eye candy all the time, and he posts all the time. Uh, when I was at Blade Show 2021, I went to his booth and got a chance to pick up his actual knives. And uh, and his wife, uh, who was very nice, was like, "Hey, do you want to do you want to enter the lotto?" And I was a little uh, green, uh, green around the edges. And I was like, "This is a lotto for." And she's like, "Yes, so that it will give you the ability to buy the knife because, you know, he 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 is one of those producers. We've spoken to him a lot of them here who have established a name and." they just make knives and then people come to them. It's not like they're, you know, I guess they're, he's got some, some books he's got to finish up or something. But the point is um, when you enter a lotto for these guys, uh, you're entering to have the ability to buy the knife, to be chosen to buy the knife. Uh, not like you get a free knife. And uh, I just m needed a little clarification. Cause I was like, of course I'm going to enter it. If there's a, a possible chance I could win this knife for free. I, that was hope against hope. Uh, I still entered and, uh, you know, I, yeah. Anyway, so JB Stout, thank you. I appreciate this Broner tool. I'm, I'm loving it. And uh, it's going to become a part of my EDC for sure. Uh, lastly, in the state of the collection, not a new knife, but a new scale. And it has breathed new life into this knife. All right, let me show it to you. I've shown you this knife a million times because it's one of my prized prized things here. This is the Spanto Ground XM18, but I had the the grind uh I had it reground by Josh at Razor Edge Knives and I had this this Python micarta scale made for it that I thought was really cool for a while and I started to really kind of get sick of it. Uh not only the pattern um but I was missing the texture. I love the classical uh, uh, XM18 Hinderer um, texture. So it wasn't a huge emergency, but I figured I, I've already put a lot of money into this knife and a lot of energy making it my knife with the regrind and such. I should do something about the scale so that I carry it more. And so I bought this after not looking for too long, this beautiful burgundy milled micarta handle scale. Uh, this is from um, Hinderer Knives. And so it's 100% up to spec, fit absolutely perfectly when I put it on. Uh, but really, oh, such beautiful burgundy micarta. And if you've been watching, following this stuff for any amount of time with me, I've been in a burgundy phase in handles, uh, what with the uh, Bastinelli and with the with the uh, knife I just showed you in my EDC and this and my Elvia, I, just burgundy micarta, just something about it I love. And this, I put it on and it started to patina, which ah, which is awesome because I have some micarta that is very stubborn about patina-ing. And even when you try and force it and rub mineral oil in it, it still soaks it up and it goes <laughs> like the, uh, my Vero engineering, um, natural 10 micarta man it's going to take a long time for that to start patinaing this right away like on the edges got dark and it's just a beautiful color just a beautiful color so i'm really excited uh to have this knife um wearing this scale i'm going to be carrying it a lot more i've been carrying it all week well i've been carrying it for four days since i got this new scale but like really it has uh, invigorated my love for it as you can see the the blade is dirty I need to flitz it, but there you go. So that is the state of the collection. Uh, I just wanted to show off that Emerson on loan and that LT right on loan and my stout Broner, bro, love this thing. And uh, and then that burgundy micarta scale, all leading up to 
the main topic of the day, which I was thinking about, um, well, it was when I got the scale for that uh, hinderer. I was like, now, now this knife is like how it needs to be. And of course, I will always keep this uh, this scale with the Python micarta. I might rotate it into my, uh, onto an, another hinderer. But for now, that's how, and, and it just got me thinking, what are the knives I, you know, I know that uh, if if my girls had to had to approach my knife cabinet, if I heaven forbid weren't here tomorrow, they'd have a lot to go through. But what are the ten that I think they should hold on to, and um, kind of carry down through for whatever reason? And I gotta say, man, what a what a difficult thing, especially considering I have a number of customs now, and I just have so many really awesome. Uh, examples in my collection. What what are the things that I would want them, or I would hope they held on to? Uh, so funny question and, uh, you know, funny to think about your mortality in that way. But hey, you know, doesn't, maybe I just completely lose interest in knives overnight. And I'm like, here, you deal with it. Uh, what are the 10 that I'd want them to hold on to? Okay, you get the point. So uh, first one is obvious if you if you know me at all. It's the Cold Steel Master Tanto. This one I got in the late 80s when I was in high school. I think I was a junior in high school. And just a an amazing classic. For me, definitely the one that started it all. Uh, if you look at this beautifully hollow ground blade on, on both sides, but especially on this side, it's scratched. Because when I first started making my card of sheaths, I made one for this, and I scratched the damn blade. And that's always, always stuck in my craw. Um, boy, it's funny how uh, even though this it's a rubberized craton tacky handle, over the years it has not, you know, sometimes I feel like craton breaks down, rubberized handles, you starts to feel overly sticky, almost like it's melting in slow motion. Uh, this has not done that at all. Uh, the brass fittings here, the, the pommel with the uh, off kilter hole. I always thought that was a nice little handmade, hand ish made touch. Um, but the uh, it's all nice and patinaed, made in Japan back in the day. Uh, designed in cold, uh, cold steel, Ventura, California, Tanto on one side, made in Japan on the other. Uh, just an awesome knife. This is the knife that uh, my good friend Mike was like, Oh, yeah, you gotta, you gotta check out this knife, man. Um, he had seen it in some catalog or some magazine, and I remember him saying, uh, yeah, CIA agents carry it, and they use it to punch through car doors. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. And now I realize, like, no, they don't. Uh, they might, maybe some CIA guy carried it, but and you could punch it through a car door, but they have no need for a tool to do that. But in any case, it added to the mystique and drove me to the Randall Park Mall to buy it at Remington Steel. Uh, Remington Blades. Uh, of course, none of that is still existent, but those were the days. All right, next is my very first and probably, let's just say this, the first like fine knife I ever bought was this. This was in the year 1999 I purchased this. Uh, however, this is a, a, a 2000 model. Uh, when I bought this from Knife Center, I didn't realize, I'm sure they told me, but I didn't check. Uh, I didn't realize that this wasn't immediately available. I just saw it and I was like, I don't have the kind of money to buy that knife, but I'm going to do it anyway because I have a credit card. And, uh, you know, the whole world could end tomorrow. That was my kind of unsophisticated justification back in the day. Now I have more sophisticated layers of justification that help me make these purchases. Uh, but this one... Uh, I ordered sometime in 1999. Uh, my only experience in buying things online to this point was buying a Macintosh computer, which arrived the next day. So I just assumed my Emerson Commander would arrive the next day. It didn't. It didn't even arrive the next month or the month after that or the month after that. And then soon I kind of forgot about it. Um, and then one day it showed up on my desk at work. And I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, now, uh, you know, being older and also 
more sophisticated with how things work online, I would have, I would have, uh, you know, been all over them until I was, you know, had my knife or I had some explanation. But back then I was just like, hey, I don't know. And so I just let it happen. And then it showed up unexpected. And it was my main carry for a long time. Uh, it has the cool old dome pivots. Uh, of course, it's a double detent. Uh, it's built more like a um, custom knife in that the scale, when you take the scale off and remove the pivot pin, you still have the whole knife built underneath it with uh, um, screws that go into the backspacer in here that you can't see from the outside. So it's, it has more of a uh, custom knife uh, sort of uh, production. Uh, really smooth, uh, interesting, almost looks handmade G10. You can actually see the weaves of the fiber and uh, thinner than most uh, Emerson's now. Still 154 cm and just uh, just an awesome, awesome knife. Uh, been with me a long time. I would like that to stick around uh, in the collection. Uh, but hey, I might not uh, be the one who makes that decision. Next excuse me, is, is a knife that I'm including because I just, I think it is still one of the most good looking knives ever. <laughs> it is the VSEP and uh, it all, it by Les George, Les George Knives. It is also an incredibly useful knife. Feels amazing in hand, even with that simple, very neutral handle, just has amazing ergonomics an excellent blade grind. This is XHP steel, which I've always liked. And uh, this is the most simple sort of iteration of it. It's it, uh, the VSEP now is made in a flipper. It has different, uh, you know, milling patterns and things. You know, you can you can get the the VSEP in a number of different ways. But to me, this, despite its black blade, is the most simple sort of incarnation of this. I do wish he didn't add those three screws there for tip down carry. That's just ridiculous, but it's not a deal breaker. Absolutely love this knife. I have it in automatic form uh, from ProTech. And uh, I think the rock eye, which is the design that this is based on is just, uh, you know, it, it, it belongs next to the commander. It belongs next to the XM 18, the Sabenza, uh, the Strider, the classic, classic modern folders. This knife deserves to be included in there. Um, I remember when it came out, everyone was concerned it was the Sabenza killer. Well, I'll say I love the Sabenza. I love the Sabenza, but I think I would go with the VSEP because the VSEP is in this and the Sabenza is not. All right, next up is the knife I was showing you before. This is the Hinderer XM18 three and a half inch Spanto with the reground Spanto, uh, the way it should be, and probably the way it was originally made as a custom, but with a really thin hollow ground main section here, very thin. Josh does incredible work, Josh at Razor Edge Knives. And then perfectly flat and extremely sharply pointed uh, tip there. When I got this, it was much thicker, uh, uh, saber ground, and, and not even that pointy. I mean, pointy enough. But that tip that uh, Josh put on there, I mean, you could really do some scalpel-like work with. Um, so yes, this one I will, I will always keep because uh, I think hinderers are that great. And this one to me is the most personal because it was, like I said, reground. And for a while it was wearing this custom, uh, custom scale. Now it's got this uh, burgundy and is really... Uh, feels complete. And to me, this is just a knife I would want to go go down beyond me because I think it is such a great um, example of a great knife. So there it is. XM18 in Spanto, reground Spanto and Micarta. That's S35VN, by the way. And uh, in case you were wondering, it is a, a Gen 4, I think, you know, so it doesn't have bearings. It doesn't have the retuned detent and the triway pivot. It's just an old school hinderer and man, it works great. Actually, I'm sure the hinderer collectors, if there are any out there saying that's not old school, that's a, that's a generation four, that's mid school or whatever, but you know what I mean? It doesn't have all the fancy bells and whistles 
of the new ones. Um, but I, I do love it indeed. All right, next up would be my first custom ordered, custom made knife. And not because it is that, but because it is a beautiful, beautiful thing and uh, seems like work from another era. And I had my brother make me this beautiful leather sheath for it. So it has a double meaning, um, double level of importance. Uh, but removing the beautiful sheath and, and looking at it, this is the attention to detail mercantile A2D. This is the medium sized fighter. Now I got this one with the bayonet grind and I got the top edge sharpened. And uh, he did that right before my very eyes. I, uh, uh, Douglas Esposito lives somewhat close to me, and I went to his shop when I picked this up, when I bought it, and uh, he wanted to make sure with me in person that I wanted that double edge, and I said, yes, please, and he said, you're sure? I said, yes, please, and then he ground it on, and man, it's razor sharp, and this thing is also really nicely hollow ground, and I feel like for something like this, this is called the fighter, this is a fighting knife, it's balanced as a fighting knife uh, right here at the first choil. It's got this incredible jimping, just a beautiful design, great handle. Um, man, I love this. Uh, but for a fighter, I feel like it should be hollow ground and both of these bevels are nice and hollow ground. Um, so just a great knife and I love um, uh, uh, tortoise shell. I'm just a huge fan of tortoise shell. So the tortoise shell with the brass liners and the brass pins, just a classy, classy knife, especially with that black blade. So this one will, will stick around and hopefully that, uh, hopefully it keeps someone feeling safe for a long time hence. Uh, love that knife. All right, next up is, um, I felt like it was necessary to have a large cold steel folder in there because they're just so damn cool and they're so unique. But I was wondering which one, and, and it occurred to me it has to be this. This is the quintessential large cold steel knife. And the reason I say that is this. It, it really highlights the fit and finish they can achieve uh, with the aluminum bolsters and the smooth uh, G10. It really, you know, that so they, they get the fit and finish part of this beautifully. Uh, it's innovative in that it, it has the triad lock, so it's super strong, but look at it. It looks like a Navaja. It looks like a classic Spanish fighting folder here. And um, that was the first thing that drew me into the large cold steels way back when, uh, early 90s, late 2000s or so, with the Vaquero Grande, that big sinuous shaped blade. To me, I was like, oh my God, someone's making a large Vaquero style knife or not Vaquero, uh, uh, Navaja style knife, and I have to get it. And uh, that has always been the thing about the Cold Steel XL knives that have reeled me in, are the ones that look like this, the ones that have that Navaja traditional feel, and with that horn-shaped handle, and all the different ways you can grip it. Um, so I, I choose this one because it has the most the most qualities of these large cold steels uh, in one knife. You know, maybe actually if I, if I thought about it a little more, maybe I would have put the seven and a half inch version of this knife because it has all the fit and finish of the bolsters and the smooth G10, but it's a ridiculous seven and a half inches. So maybe that's the knife I should, we'll, maybe we'll make an addendum somewhere down the road and it will actually be the seven inch. But you know what, that knife is so damn big, 13 inches I think when it's open, that it's not even gonna fit here, or no, 15 inches, I think, when it's open. It's not even gonna fit here, so. Anyway, there it is, the Espada uh, large with full dress. I don't know if, if that's what they call it, but that's what I'm calling it, full dress. Now, speaking of this full, full dress sort of cold steel, who out there wouldn't love it if they came back with the, uh, with the what was that called, the Black Bear? What a cool folder that was, man. Um, I hope they bring that back. And Black Bear, is that what it's called? Now, uh, leave in the comments. You know which one I'm talking about. The big five-inch clip point, uh, Black Rhino. Black Rhino? 
I don't know. Uh, call the listener line. Let me know what it is. 724-466-4487. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe it's the black rhino, uh, but it's got the beautiful aluminum bolsters on the front and the back, and it's got a really nice shaped handle and a big fat clip point blade. And they never made any other knife uh, kind of in that series. That was the one. They never made a G10 version of it or anything like that. Call me. Let me know, please. 724-466-4487. Is it the black rhino? Um, maybe you know. All right, next. And with a bit of Cold Steel pedigree, um, because of Demco, <laughs> is the Demco Knives AD20. Oh my goodness gracious. This knife, this is an MG machine ground blade. Uh, it'd be nice to have a fully hand ground blade, but hey, it was hand sharpened by them. So um, just an amazing knife with this incredible lock. So uh, Andrew Demko, as you can see, is represented uh, two different places here because he designed the Espada and the lock. And uh, another innovation of his on the folding knife lock is right here on this knife, the shark lock. Um, so named because it has a fin that sticks above. Um, Everything about this knife I love. It's big, it's sharp, it's robust, but it's uh, 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 slicey enough for my purposes. The milling is amazing. It is uh, got two different kinds of jimping that are both incredibly grippy and nice. Uh, this jimping that runs the full straight uh, part of the spine here, so you can bring your thumb way up there and engage jimping. And then all the way back on this on this uh, locking tab, very fine jimping. What a great knife this is. Uh, ergonomically just incredible in every grip. And even when you're choked up like this and squeezing with a hammer grip, you don't even feel that shark lock. So most knives that have anything protruding uh, on the spine like that, mm, unless it's nice and forward up on the blade as a, as a thumb ramp, to me, I don't like it. I don't like it when you see locks back there or, or what have you, but or secondary locks. But this shark lock just defies that. And uh, it's just another example of why this is such an amazing knife. Um, the 8020. And if you don't have an 8020, but you have access to get an 8020.5, by all means, get that knife. That is an awesome, awesome knife. The 8020.5. Uh, they, they found a great manufacturer in Taiwan to take this design and go production, go broad, go wide with it. And they did a great job. I should have pulled it off to show it off. Pulled it out to show it off, but I didn't. All right, three more knives in my heirloom collection. And um, well, let's just get to it. Next one is this, the TRM Atom. I have two TRM Atoms, uh, but this one is more special to me. Um, this is the one I got recently. Um, it is a two dot, meaning there is a flaw in the DL in the uh, DLC uh, diamond light coating. I believe it's right there, but you can't tell because this is messy. Actually, I cut something with a piece of fruit or something with it and didn't clean it. Um, sorry about that. But this one, uh, I was given a special opportunity to buy this knife um, by Marianne Halpern, so she helped me get this knife. So it means that means that to me, but she also put this beautiful G Carta scale on it for me. And I'm very grateful because I love this green G Carta. GL Hansen and Sons, you know, uh, they make this, this, these crazy kind of micartas with all these beautiful different colors and patterns and um, just masters at making micarta. They call it G Carta. Um, and I'm just, every once in a while, uh, TRM will buy some, Three Rivers Manufacturing will buy some, and they'll mill out some handles for, they just did a drop for the Neutron, uh, which is the smaller version of this knife. And uh, they put out a bunch of G Carta scales. Love this material. And this G Carta in particular, I only have it on one other knife, a Protec, and that G Carta is polished. This is not polished. And it feels like, it's almost velveteen. It's, 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 it feels like fabric, but not like it's coming apart, if you know what I mean. Um, it's hard to explain, very hard to explain. But uh, 
why would this be an heirloom knife? Because it is one of the best knives, one of the best folders I've ever used or experienced. I mean, you know, it is very svelte, thin, beautifully tight and beautifully, um, what, what am I trying to say? The, the tolerances are very tight on this, uh, but it's a pleasure to use. And that blade is incredibly slicey. It's, it's got a thin blade stock and a very high height uh, flat grind. And this thing is just a laser beam through food. I, I use this a lot for fruit, I gotta be honest. Uh, you can also use this for sharpening pencils to great, great success. I love sharpening pencils with knives. Uh, use the pencils a lot for work, uh, but also this is a good one for paper, paper on a mat, just like this. So the TRM Atom is definitely on my list of 10 heirloom knives. And this one, especially because of the sentimental value. Now, uh, this is a good place to pause before I get to the last two, just to say that there are a lot of knives that didn't make this cut that have more sentimentality built into them than some of these. Um, you know, for instance, folders that my grandfather gave me. Yes, I would still like those to be passed down, but in a way, those are a given because my grandfather gave them to me. Those, I, there's no way I would get rid of them. Uh, but a lot of my collection here, uh, I have a lot of great pieces that I would still get rid of if I had to in a pinch. Uh, but there are some that I would really think um, shouldn't be sold. And, and should go on in time as examples of great cutlery in the 2020s. Okay, all right, enough about that. Uh, the last two knives, last uh, second to last one here is very special knife to me for a couple of reasons. One, it is at the pinnacle of modern, robust, modern, tactical titanium frame lock folders. And it is the Spartan Harzi folder. Uh, the main, the, the large four inch bladed original model in this was plain Jane, totally plain Jane with the stonewashed titanium. Uh, it had a plain filler tab and it didn't have my uh, logo engraved in it. After I interviewed Curtis Iovito on the Knife Junkie podcast, he said, send me your logo and send me your knife and I'll get it on there. And he did. And it looks so great. I love the way it looks, but even more than that, it just means a lot to me that he did that for free and for, um, you know, it was his idea and it was out of the goodness of his heart. And I really appreciated that and not for nothing, but they also put my logo on the filler tab. It's hard to see. I wonder if it'll focus, but there's my uh, knife junkie logo there too. So taking a really outstanding knife, putting this flourish on it, uh, just really, uh, makes my day. Now, the one thing that I might consider doing, and that would make this triply uh, uh, triply meaningful, is to have the blade reground. Wouldn't that be awesome? Just to get a nice, hollow, very, very thin, hollow grind on this S35VN would be awesome. Ergonomics on this are just outstanding. I know a Harzi knife when I see it, and this is the quintessential Harzi design, if you ask me. All right, I'm going to put this down here, crossways. And then the last one, I think you know what this is going to be. Uh, it's obvious if you've uh, uh, been following me, at least in the last two or three weeks, you know what the answer is going to be. Um, the last one on my list, of course, is my 50th birthday knife. Uh, this is made by Matt Chase, Hog Tooth Knives. I'm going to Hog tooth knives. Check him out on Instagram. His work is beautiful. Uh, everything from hunting knives and sort of tactical knives to incredible kitchen knives. Uh, just, just gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. And uh, after talking to him on the podcast, a funny thing happened uh, on that podcast. We discovered that um, he served with a very good friend of mine in the same uh, Marine Corps scout sniper unit or on the same ship uh, during Kosovo. And uh, and that person also happened to be a guest on the Knife Junkie podcast very early on, Drew Swift. So they, you know, a connection was made and I just fell in love with the knives he was showing on the podcast. And afterward, uh, I vowed to have him make my 50th birthday knife. Um, and 
long and short of it is uh, my parents said, actually, we would like to be the benefactors of that because we don't know what to get you for your 50th birthday. And this is a very meaningful thing. And so uh, they said, get exactly what you want. And uh, I was blown away by that. And so I did. And this is exactly what I wanted. And he um, really made this thing come true. What I wanted was a classic subhilt, a loveless subhilt fighter. But I wanted stag and uh, pattern weld Damascus, you know, pattern uh, Damascus steel, because that's something that Matt Chase does really, you know, with great skill and creativity. And um, I sent him the dimensions I would like, and this is what he built. And uh, we'll start here with the steel. This is uh, 1095 and 15 and 20. And um, he showed me process pictures of him forging billets and then cutting them, reforging them, cutting them, and then laying them side by side and welding them. And uh, man, it's just created this really, really intricate pattern here. And um, then he, obviously he forged out the blade, pounded it out to shape. And then he, uh, he refined it with the grinder, putting on really nice hollow grinds. Uh, both edges are screaming sharp, just absolutely razor sharp. And, uh, you know, that's a sub hilt folder thing, or yeah, that sub hilt folder blade is a long slender clip point with, with, uh, the edge sharpened all the way up to the hilt on both sides. And then of course you have the guard and the sub hilt. This is the sub hilt. It looks like a trigger. If you're not, if you're just listening, it kind of looks like a trigger that goes between your main, uh, your forefinger and your middle finger. And it's, uh, that's what makes this a sub hilt fighter, obviously. And that helps you control this little sort of trigger action, helps you control the knife, uh, helps you do snap cuts and all sorts of stuff, but it, it's also there to help you remove the knife uh, just in case you have to remove it from something. <laughs> and uh, so these, uh, the guard and the sub hilt here are made of wrought iron that was taken from a bridge in Boston and, uh, just a cool, great story. And then look at when you look at the guards from this aspect. Uh, when you look down on them, you see that they they um, flare out and then round out at the end. And then uh, this sub hilt is faceted on eight different angles. It's just an outstanding knife. And then uh, I bumped into Matt at Blade Show 2021. He was there buying materials. One of one of those things was this beautiful stag, silver pins a coffin construction, coffin tank construction. Oh God, the, sorry to invoke the, the mighty one, but man alive, I love this knife. It is, uh, it is the one that if they get rid of all others, this one's gotta stick around. So those have been my top 10 future heirloom knives. I'm gonna go through them in the order I presented them. Got the Cold Steel uh, uh, Master Tanto, got the, um, Emerson Commander from 2000, got the VSEP from Les George, the Spanto Ground, reground Spanto Ground, uh, XM18, three and a half inch. We have the attention to detail, medium fighter, bayonet double edge. Uh, got the Espada XL with the full dress and S35 VN steel. Uh, the AD20 from, from uh, the machine ground blade from... Um, Demco knives, the Three Rivers Manufacturing Adam with the GL Hansen and Son handles, and uh, the uh, coming back over here is the Spartan Harzi with my logo in it, and then last but not least is my 50th birthday knife uh, by Hogtooth Knives. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. So these things are not only um, worth uh, keeping, but they are and worth passing down. But they're all made in such incredibly uh, you know, stout ways and in, in such, uh, with such skill that they should go down, not only as surviving examples of how good they are, of how good knives are, are in these, in this age, what the hell am I trying to say? But, but also just great functioning knives. So take these girls and I was going to say run with them, but don't run with them because they're knives. Oh my goodness. Okay. I've spoken too long. Um,
thanks for watching. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to now have uh, a, um, a record of what my, what my heirloom knives are going to be. So there you have it. Uh, be sure to join us on Sunday for episode 248. You just go to theknifejunkie.com slash 248 to listen. Uh, I talk again with Michael Janich. Michael Janich, such an awesome guy, founder of Marshall Blade Concepts, designer of the Yojimbo, the Yojumbo, the Ronin, and a host of other knives from other makers. Uh, he is the head of special projects over at Spyderco and such an interesting guy to talk to uh, about, about knife design, about self-defense, about He's got such uh, an amazing resume uh, working for alphabet agencies and such. Uh, you got to check that out. Uh, you can also listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeart, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and a whole bunch of other podcast apps. So uh, in case you, uh, you're mowing the lawn and you don't want to look at my face while I'm blabbing about knives, just, just check it out on one of the podcast apps. Uh, that's what I do. All right, so uh, uh, be sure to join us Thursday Night Knives tomorrow night uh, for another great live live stream. Um, go to Instagram, check out the pictures there, and, you know, all the usual places. We're also on Facebook and Twitch for Thursday Night Knives, an interesting little tidbit. All right, so for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.